Hello, and welcome back to Aetheral Space 13.50, The Flower of Evil. We are back. Hey guys, sorry we wasted all the good bits before we hit recording. <laughs> we started to watch a psychotic Hallmark movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not ready for it. Anyway, that's You're not really going to come out. <laughs> yeah, we'll release it. Get writing. Anyway. <laughs> I can't stop thinking about it. Aetheral Space, <laughs> I just keep thinking of 30k salary. <laughs> it's like not even can support one person. <laughs> um, Aetheral Space, 13.50. The Flower of Evil. It's been a while, Atoy Mizazi said. Del said. He wasn't certain which of the twins was tied up before him, was glaring at him, so he thought it best to be non-specific. No doubt those closer to the duo would have been able to tell through facial expressions and body language, but those had never been Musazi's strong suit. You are really laying it on thick that this man is autistic. What do you mean? I, I appreciate it, though. <laughs> He's simply a serious man. There's In no, such there, a situation... <laughs> there's no hints. <laughs> do you not like this name? In such a situation, it was best to err on the side of caution, especially since this pair might have designs to kill him. They looked up at him with dull green eyes, narrowed in resentment or just because the room was dark. Perhaps resentment because the room was dark. The small chamber was hardly luxurious. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, my throat's a little phlegmy. No problem. It no. has. Well, we the get a lot of flame flying. around here, but that's okay. <laughs> we, just <like laughs> to spit, we just spit it and like in the big city where they make you put it in the woke tubes. <laughs> The woke tubes? Yeah, the woke spit tubes? like a little vial that you have to spit into. <laughs> yeah, it gets sent to your mayor and he fucking... Rates it. <laughs> Dead out of it. Based team. on various factors. You. <laughs> this is gross. It's a matter of opinion. <laughs> <clears throat> it has, the prisoner replied, their voice gruff. Last time I saw you was probably at the true meet. Here you were at Elysian Fields, though. Elysian Fields. Murderer. That's right. Muzazi replied quietly, Your Esmeralda acquitted himself well, defeating the Supreme in combat. It was a splendid victory. He died, Del said, grunted. Can you really call that a victory? A shiver went down Muzazi's spine. So long as you die after your opponent, he finally said, you can consider that a victory, no matter the circumstances of their end. Del said snorted. True believers, he muttered. It's like someone took a whisk to your brain. Muzazi cleared his throat, standing up straight as he banished the toxic memory from his mind. I'm told you came looking for me, he said. Do you bear a message? What is it that Dragon Hadrian wants from me? Del said frowned exaggeratedly, and when they spoke next, their voice was much lighter. I told your weird little paper boy, they scowled, we're not working for Mr. Dragon. We haven't even spoken to him in two years. Since Elysian Fields... Mm-hmm. Del said nodded. Muzazi considered it. Indeed, Gregory had passed along this story to him, the story the Del said twins had insisted upon since they were captured. They and Blaine weren't with Hadrian currently, but was that really testimony he could trust? And yet you've come to speak with me. Or sorry, and yet you've come to speak to me, Muzazi mused. Why? Del said's expression hardened again. You've seen the news? If you're referring to Ruth Blaine murdering Ray Rudicia, then yes. That's bullshit, Del said snapped. It is. I don't know what happened, but I know Ruth wouldn't do that. Even if she did kill Rudicia for whatever reason, she wouldn't have gone after the other bodyguards. Someone's setting her up. I need to find her. And yet, Muzazi repeated, you've come to speak to me. Why? Del said smirked. You're the guy in charge of the turning of the air. You've got resources. You can track Ruth down for us. Muzazi raised an eyebrow. And why would I do that? Because if you do... Del said closed their eyes, and then opened them again, their voice brightening up once more. We'll help you get Mr. Jagan out of the Dawn Contest! No! The traitor- the traitorness of a squirrel! <laughs> <laughs> I don't, the betrayal, I think, would have been the better word, traitorness. <clears throat> the treachery is of a it? squirrel. The what? The treachery of a squirrel. <laughs> the treachery of a squirrel, there we go. <clears throat> this is it? <clears throat> no, sorry. This is it? Ruth whispered, looking up. What? Wu Ming said, lounging on a collapsed chunk of concrete. Not impressed? 
The thing hung from the ceiling of the ruined lobby, a cocoon of string connected by dozens of strands to the building around it. Ruth could have laughed. It looked more like a yarn ball than anything, but there was definitely something more there. She could feel it, a pressure inside her bones. I call it the cradle. Ooh, but Tian is already a cradle. <laughs> I call it the cradle. Not like the place, but like what you put a baby in. Wu Ming Is it character? Just... He would say that. <laughs> Gesturing towards the massive contract. Like he put an arrogant baby in. <laughs> you, saw, you saw me come up with the prototype back on Azum Ha, huh? but this is a bit more of a stable version. I mean, it worked great already, but it's the difference between a 7 out of 10 and a 9 out of 10, you know? So what? Ruth murmured, circling the cradle, her footsteps echoing through the abandoned apartment building. This'll turn me into a butterfly person or something? Like it did you? <laughs> nah, nah. And Wu Ming waved a hand before putting his fingers to his lips in consideration. Well, unless you want to be a butterfly person? No, no, why would you want that? That's crazy. Anyway, no, it works a little different now. How's that? Well, you've already got some pugnant in you, right? Wu Ming asked. Not full-blooded, but enough to feel some of the benefits without too many of the drawbacks. The cradle's gonna adjust things a little, give you even more of those benefits and even less of those drawbacks. Good times. Slowly, Ruth nodded, still looking at the massive cradle. So it'll make me stronger, she said. Ming nodded. Oh, is this like a cocoon to, like, edit your genes yeah. or something? Tan! What? <laughs> DNA strings. <laughs> I don't like Gene Tyrant Wu Ming. I don't like this <laughs> biological determinism, Tan. No! <clears throat> Ming nodded. <clears throat> Sorry. Yup, and that'll help you with your Aether, too. Infusion's multiplicative, not additive, right? Enhanced strength gets even more enhanced. He snapped his fingers. So it goes. You up for it? Ruth clenched her fists. If Wu Ming was telling the truth, this would give her an edge, and in her present circumstances, she needed to take all the edges she could get. But, could she trust this man? Even if he'd saved her from the Shepherdess, he had been a contender. Even if he'd betrayed the supremacy on Elysian Fields, that had just been a whim of his. Even if, right now, he reminded her more than a little of Skipper. She knew that was just a trick of the mind. But strength was strength, and weakness was weakness, and right now, Ruth Blaine had way too much of the latter. Taking a deep breath, she relaxed her hands. How long will it take? she asked, resolute. Days for the fool treatment, Ming replied instantly. If I could practice, I could probably get that time down a little. But it's tough these days, you know? He wiped a non-existent tear from his eye. I don't even have DNA anymore, so I can't test it out on myself. She looked at him, brow furrowed. What do you mean you don't have DNA anymore? He waggled his fingers menacingly. Ooh, I'm a ghost. Not even like lying. Getting a real answer there. <laughs> What'd you say? Not even lying. <laughs> he is! Oh, that's sad. He's like a safety he ghost. It it's like Casper. <laughs> real. Can he eat? Oh, uh, yeah. He's got a body that's of strength. Good. Turning her head away from Mu Ming, she returned her gaze to the cradle days, he'd said. How many days? How many days was she willing to spend? She already knew that. As many days as it took to kill the shepherdess. Open it up, she said with certainty. McCoy snapped her fingers. Corpse construct, she commanded. Level one cannon times two. Wait, was she the undead user from Arc 6? Yeah. That was her the whole time? Yeah, she was called McCoy by then. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> <clears throat> Aetheral Space is a good series. As she'd ordered, two desiccated corpses appeared hovering behind her, suspended by their arms as if crucified against invisible crosses. Orange Aether crawled over their rotten skin, and, as one, their bodies began to twist and contort. The sounds of snapping bone and tearing muscle following McCoy, she strode down the hallway of the containment facility. By the time she reached the doors at the end, the bodies had transformed utterly, their shapes reconfigured into near-cylindrical, floating defense cannons, barrels of bone poking their way out from wrenched-open jaws. In life, McCoy's ability hadn't been nearly so gruesome, but she didn't let that bother her. It wasn't as if she'd lost anything when she died. The woman who'd existed in this body before her, October Jones, was nothing to McCoy. 
They shared nothing but a shell of meat and an aether core. What about their ardent witch? Isn't that how awakenings work? Um, yeah. So what's her ardent wish? Hmm. The secret to stabilizing an Aether Awakening lay in the Aether Core itself. Only those highly compatible with their core could reliably persist after death. In cases where the core was something the Awakening had to reach for, to tap into, they were doomed to fade away. No, a stable Awakening needed a core that naturally formed the bedrock of their personality. A core they would naturally tap into with each thought that passed through their head. For McCoy, it was resignation. For the things she had come to see, though, she had no idea. Corpse construct, McCoy said, a cloud of orange aether fizzling around her. Skeleton key. No, that's Merc's ability. You stole it <laughs> from the, the camera. I obtained this ability after killing Merc. It's <laughs> 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 a big fucking. <laughs> you can't tell me you don't know I made this ability. It's in it's my thing. Diff- it's a different skeleton key. It's, it's like what, lots of actual and skeleton keys. <laughs> lots of people are gonna I'm have gonna... the names and abilities. They're going to call me a fraud for this. <laughs> a whole corpse didn't appear this time. Instead, a collection of severed fingers orbited her bandaged body, fingers of all shapes and sizes. For a moment, they floated peacefully, but then smashed together, compressing and focusing their shapes through sheer force. Blood sprayed out from the chaos, painting the pale floor below. One second, two seconds, three, and it was done. A small, thin spike of white bone, McCoy plucked it from the air. With a simple wave of the utensil, the massive doors before her smoothly slid open. This containment facility, located below the surface of Azumha, was a remnant from the reign of Rene the Raven. When she created the Galactic Intelligence Division and the Absurd Weapons Lab, the organizations had worked much more hand-in-hand, the GID providing a steady stream of human test subjects to their counterparts. As such, this containment facility was just as much a tomb, a fitting place to house the Flower of Evil. The room beyond was massive, dome-shaped, with Palatine's prison right in the center. She could just barely see it from here, a shifting mass of darkness that would have stung McCoy's eyes if she still used them. She took a step inside, and immediately the room's defenses activated. (coughs) Liquid automatics disguised as part of the floor and walls, rapid-fire turrets suspended from the ceiling, firing bullets laced with neverwire, red-hot lasers sweeping through the chamber at randomized angles and intervals, nerve toxins, vented air, sub-zero temperatures. Once McCoy had conquered the opposition, around three minutes later, she resumed her trek down towards Palatine, picking her way through rubble as she went. She kept her awareness firmly on the other awakening as she went. As she went, as she went. At the first sign of movement, at the first sign of hostility, she had to be ready to act, to abandon this mission if necessary. She heard it speak. What voice should I use? Um, this is sort of like grandiose, maybe, and maybe like a bit panicked also. Like, it's... <clears throat> this is like I like scribbling on walls in his own shit right now. And I do see it, I do, I do. You don't understand what you're talking about. A magister? A magister of one. I did climb upon the mountain, I've seen the one, and the one upon the mountain inscribed the tablet with ten words, and the words were as the mount had written them, as had been ordained, yes, ordained, 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 ordained. I do not see it. An invisible eyelid hovering over the knees of ruin. Did you know? It's already there. A hollow inside the human brain. Oh, Morose, inscribe, 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 inscribe. That is the purpose to life. Did you know? I see, I see, I see, I see. Edgar, your sin, your sin, I see it. I see it in the walls and the sky shattered like glass, like glass, you understand? Oh, don't mind if I do. Now that's the way you do it. Look, the sky. Yeah, yeah. A sapphire star ascends. Wasn't Edgar, uh, Azez's? friend who had the prince? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> is Palatine an awakening of Edgar? Let's continue. Tan? Oh my god. McCoy shuddered. There was a difference between stable and coherent. There was no doubt that Palatine was mad. A mad god. The only consistent thing about it had to be that unknown, elusive Aether core. The appearance of the Awakening didn't help that impression. The bulk of its body was composed of countless black, thin ribbons, their edges shining red from sourceless light. The ribbons swayed through the air like reeds, ripped through the air like tentacles, twitched through the air like the legs of dying spiders. Palatine's size was variable, but right now it would have dwarfed a house. That was on the small side for it. And of course, high above McCoy, right in the center of the Eldritch Mass, was the true body. It was a confusion between a fetus and a piece of chewing gum floating in the air, surrounded by the black ribbon's end like the petals of a grand flower, six severed dog heads revolving around the tiny form. 
It opened an eye mouth, and red nectar poured forth without end. It opened a mouth eye, and continued to speak, to whisper, to impart. McCoy knew this thing was mad, of course, but she also knew it told nothing but the truth. Edgar, Edgar, your sin, I see it flourishing, bulging, Edgar, you little uh, reprobate! When you get angry, it's paramount to count numbers. They'll impart you, paint over your face, I'd recommend it ten out of ten. You won't even remember that you're dying in this review, are you serious? Now that's just not something I can stand up for. Civil justice is as well and good and all, but... Mm, that's a little lewd, don't you think? Is that acceptable? I don't want to bash your head in, but I think you should go back to the drawing board and rethink this one. I don't want to be mean, but you might want to have some second thoughts here, okay? A cosmic judiciary! Have you seen the face of the absolute, driven mad by corpses and ghosts? You have to laugh, do you? You were born with free will, after all. Your sin is swelling underneath your skin, screaming. Will do you no good now, your bare feet on Panacea? What do you think? Now that's what a star looked like. McCoy took a step forward. What do you want? The voice of Palatine, previously boisterous and rambling, turned sharp and cold. McCoy could feel the entirety of its attention upon her, like she were an ant beneath a magnifying glass. The first thing she said would be paramount. She understood that. Her words would determine whether this was a conversation or a crime scene. She did not open her mouth. Her body didn't work like that. But she spoke all the same. I came here to speak to you. For a good while, there was silence, save for the quiet hissing of the waving ribbons and the angry bubbling of the fetal angel. Then... Is that you, Westmore? Yes, McCoy responded without hesitation. It's me. We used to talk. And we did, McCoy continued, circling the containment fence. I'd hope we can keep that tradition going. Is McCoy Westmore? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, shit. There is lore here. I need to know. So is this the awakening of the original guy who created the prince, and he's tapping into all the knowledge of the the peep things the prince has seen and interacted with? Uh, I would not. Mm -mm. Mm, yeah. Cool <laughs> Did I guess it? Uh, maybe, no. <laughs> <laughs> you say no, and yes. I, what the <laughs> fuck can I say that you would not take as confirmation that all your theories are correct? <laughs> That's just because I'm a genius, sorry. Don't feel bad. Just don't change the story. There's no like response that, I can give. If I say no, you're like, hmm. So he really means yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I say but, nothing, you're like, hmm, I guessed it. <laughs> is it is it really no though? It's a it's a I, I would say it's a cool theory. Thank you. As she spoke, she inspected the fence before her. It was a tri-functional containment field, keeping Palatine housed through an electromagnetic field, an experimental energy shield, and some kind of applied aether ability. The structure of the defense has changed from second to second, presumably to stop Palatine from bypassing the containment with its ignorance. Ignorance capitalized, so presumably a technique of some kind. <clears throat> the thing squirmed in the air, bubbles rising and popping from its gnarled red skin. Talk about what? If McCoy still had the required facial muscles, she would have smirked. This was going better than she expect. McCoy's right arm went flying off. Immediately, McCoy's awareness snapped back down to inspect her body, where, without a doubt, her right arm was still attached. Had that been a hallucination? Some kind of illusion? Besides ignorance, she'd heard that Palatine had developed many other half-formed subconscious abilities. More words crawled into her head, nearly indistinguishable from her own inner monologue. Oh, baby, baby, baby. You aren't that guy. You aren't Lucifer Westmore. Why lie, hmm? Why lie to me, baby, baby, baby? Unwrap those bandages and show me what's going on under there. <laughs> McCoy cringed. Just like its personality, Palatine's level of intelligence was variable, too. It seemed she'd caught it on a day where it'd be difficult to fool. I have a proposition for you, she pushed on. Why? McCor McCoy cocked her head. Why? What do you mean, why? Why would I obey? Slowly, McCoy nodded. If you go along with my request, you'll have a chance to run wild. Perhaps a chance for permanent freedom. You'll be able to leave this place behind. Does that sound appealing to you? Oh, baby, baby, baby. I'll tell you what sounds appealing to me. Unwrap those bandages and show me red, red squelching meat full of blood and pus and fat and wet and dry. Do you remember when you were alive? McCoy called out, interrupting the sleazy monologue. No answer. She repeated herself. Do you remember when you were alive? Do not presume! McCoy looked down. She was high over the ground now, impaled through the chest by one of those black ribbons, dried and crystallized blood spilling out of her wound and clattering on the floor. If she'd been human, that would have been her death just now. 
Instead, she just looked up. I am alive! As am I, McCoy grunted. But there was a life before this one, too. A journey this corpse walked. It was a fool. It dived into the darkness of this world and thought it could clear it all away. I thought it would find the sun there, down in the bowels of the universe. Can you imagine? What do you propose? Slowly, as to not arouse retribution, McCoy raised her hand, the hand holding a new, thin, white skeleton key. I want to break the shape of this world, McCoy hissed. I want to shatter it into a thousand pieces and do it right this time. And I want you to help me. Palatine considered. Palatine giggled, moaned, wailed, groaned, skittered, guffawed, screamed, whimpered, sang, and delighted. Palatine decided. So this was actually, I think, a shorter chapter because of all the big texts. Yeah. <laughs> that was intriguing, though. Many questions about Palatine and what his role is. Oh my god, it's like we eat every day. Thank you. <laughs> Please, eat Oh some my more. god. <laughs> Here comes the choo-choo train. Banger, honey? I think that's the parody. Uh, banger, honey? Bangers and mash, honey? Sure. Uh, alright. Is that, is that British still? Yeah, kinda. Kind of. Kind of, or is that Scottish? I forget what bangers and mash is. Uh, okay, hang on. I'm trying to find the Aether questions. It's kind of weird you'd say yes. that, given its reference to like that protest massacre back in the 60s, but... Wait, is it actually? No. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Gave me, like, a panic. <laughs> um, JTKC... <laughs> they, they, they crushed everyone with bricks and said bangers and mash music. <laughs> so first, Lan asked a question, but I think we already know the answer based on how you describe North's abilities in Arc 3. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to record light? Oh, yeah. JTKC asks, if most, char most characters had insignificant Aether ticks, what were some invisible ticks from characters we know? Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Ruth has one I only noticed because of someone rereading that you only mentioned once ever in Arc 3, which is that her hair lights up. I mentioned this multiple times. I don't think so. I do. I don't believe you. I do. I <laughs> mentioned it. Um, hmm. And that's not that's the opposite of invisible. <laughs> well, Skinner uh, has been okay. basically an invisible one where his eyes would turn more and more green over time. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really cool reveal, too. Someone noticed that. They were like, wait, I thought it was green, but it says it's gray early on. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it was on purpose. Because it would use the Um... Quaker asks, is there an in-universe reason that Gene Terrence were named after historical queens? There is not an in-universe reason. I just think it's a fun naming scheme. Okay, I figured as much. And then, I'll save some for next time, so I'll just do one more. Lan asks, does the Abyssal Knight Seal of Healing have the same time restrictions as Panacea? Um, it works a little bit differently. It can only heal what could be healed without the seal. It just accelerates it. I was going to say, because otherwise you wouldn't have been able to do the dust move in Arc 11 if that was the case, right? Oh, that's right. Because the dust has presumably been dust for a very long time. Uh, All right. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's a bit different, because he was, like, hacking the ability, basically, at that point. True. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening, as always, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.